So first of all, thank you very, very much for inviting me to this uh, extremely thought-provoking couple of days. I'm going to go home and have a lot to think about and look up. So the, um, I'm very grateful for that, and I also want to extend my deep thanks to the staff. It's been mentioned before, but without the staff, these kinds of things don't come off, and this has been very, very smooth and really uh, nurturing. So uh, thank you very, very much. And also to my fe fellow panelists for developing some extremely provocative and um, thought out and passionate discussion around this question of the Anthropocene. So while my talk is not going to be so um, relevant perhaps specifically to Asia, the issue of urbanization is certainly global and applying to Asia as well. One of the most uh, shocking and remarkable things going on in Japan is depopulation and people moving to Tokyo. So much like other places in the world, these processes are taking place here too. And so what I want to offer in this talk is some reflection on what that means in this era of the Anthropocene and some of the potential consequences of um, the continuing growth of these cities and, some, and try to question some of the assumptions behind the idea that um, cities are going to continue to grow endlessly. So I come to this uh, question working with colleagues who are ecologists and hydrologists and um, system scientists spatial data analysts, and um, I also would like to say, following one of the earlier talks, it's really not possible to think about these questions independently as single scholars in single disciplines. Really, the prospective understanding of the future and also just unpacking of the present requires multiple, multiple disciplines to come together and develop language across which we can have a conversation. And that is very time consuming and not always very easy, but nevertheless enormously enriching. And so part of my thrill about being here is to listen to how these questions are being cast from a humanities perspective um, and learning the vocabulary and the ways of approaching the problem. So hopefully um, my next set of endeavors will be uh, better off for having had this experience. So I'm interested in sustainable urban systems um, and the question of transitioning to the post-carbon Anthropocene. Because while um, we have, is here, is to change? Nope. Um, well, I would like to make a, a little aside since I have a pause here. Um, one of the ways in which uh, the digital is deeply embedded in um, earth systems change and climate change is the amount of energy those, earth, those data system centers need to survive. And that is a very close connection to climate change. Anyway, so, um, okay, what are sustainable, okay. Where was I? All right, so I think that one of the things that we have to recognize is that at some point, at some point, uh, the question of post-carbon uh, is going to appear. Hydrocarbons are not infinite uh, resources. And so we might as well prepare ourselves somehow to think about what a post-hydrocarbon world will look like. So a lot of my reflection is really based on that. So what are sustainable urban systems in the future? So I will posit in that light that they will be city systems that are supplied largely by close hinterlands. And I'll, I'll explain that uh, a bit more. Because city systems that have uh, little to no reliance on hydrocarbon fuels and inputs will no longer be able to draw resources from afar. Parisians will not eat Senegalese grown green beans. Um, uh, I will and so on. City systems that nurture new values of cooperation, collaboration, and interdependence among humans, 
between humans and nature will be necessary for those urban systems and people, period, to be able to live in this very different world. And that they are cities that would be based on care, craft, and creativity, which I took from um, Jackson's book on uh, prosperity without growth. So what I want to suggest is that for humans to live in cities and on the planet going forward, we are going to have to refound a whole number of ways in which we organize ourselves and with the places we live in. So this question of the Anthropocene, um, it's a very flashy term. Uh, I use it, but I'm also um, quite aware that it is a political term at the same time in a, in a kind of uh, way of, pro uh, it's almost a provocative term as well. I'm not entirely convinced that there was a specific turning point since humans have been embedded in nature and transforming nature ever since, uh, well, all animals are, for that matter. And so the question of the Anthropocene simply focuses the mind on the ways in which hydrocarbons have poisoned the planet, let alone begun to affect the way the climate works. But what I think is so interesting about this um, question of the Anthropocene is that the more we have Earth systems changes, the more intimate our relationship with the planet becomes because we're ever more inextricably bound with that planet and those changes, worries about disasters, worries about sea level rise, worries about inundation, makes us even closer to that nature which we are paradoxically affecting and changing, destabilizing what we thought of as a stable period. And so I think that given the level and rate and weight of urbanization, the way through to a different state relationship with nature is through cities. So we know that they are now the places where humans live. We've never been urban be this urban before and all of that. But more importantly, I think, it's that cities are the motors of global economic growth in a kind of neoliberal, um, late capitalist uh, time of, uh, of human existence. The other thing to remember is that they are concentrates of Earth, concentrated resources extracted from nature. There is nothing here that is not natural. It's been transformed, it's been manufactured, but it all essentially comes from nature. So how we understand that is important to moving towards greater urban sustainability and involves coupled integrated research methods. Um, cities are also seen, of course, as the most important actors in mitigating climate change, which is a very interesting uh, additional paradox. Um, and I suggest that one way to begin to look at, oh, my, the screen isn't very good, is it? Um, is uh, to begin to unravel current Earth uh, dependencies through this concept of urban metabolism. I like to think of urban metabolism with my um, anthropological background uh, as a way to do thick description. So there is quantification, uh, accounting, life cycle analysis, material flows analysis, and how those are distributed across landscapes, which reveal inequalities in a very uh, poignant and, and, and important way. Uh, we have to take into account the codes and conventions and rules that shape urban morphology. Cities, uh, at least in, in many places, but not in, in where there are lots of informal settlements, but even within informal settlements, there are all kinds of rules about what you do and what you don't do and how you do it, and those establish um, kind of dependencies and lock-ins in terms of size of streets and the ways of the cars move and so on and so forth. And those are really important to understand because they condition the possibilities of change. And then, of course, there's the larger context of global and political forces, the trade compacts, the corporate networks, some of the cyber work that we just saw. Why does it go through Cairo? What does that mean that it goes through Cairo? What are the po geopolitical and economic forces that make those centers so significant? And so cities sit in this complex network that shapes them and constrains change. So what we need to do is really develop complex uh, models 
that integrate these multiple levels of and dimensions of what creates the cities that we have today as drivers, but understand that there's no uh, prototype. What happens in Cairo and reasons behind Cairo are really different than Paris or London or LA or other places. So really thinking both very specifically but using very generalizable methods. Um, let's see, wrong one. So, hmm. I'm not advancing. Okay, next, down. So you, urban metabolism helps shed light on earth resource dependencies and our high energy modernity. Modern industrial economies utilize between 20 and 30 tons per capita of materials per year. That's really important to understand. Um, there's lots and lots of statistics around, that, around this. In 2011, 79 gigatons of materials were extracted globally, expected to rise to 167 gigatons by 2060. Concrete is responsible for 9% of the total GHG emissions. 7% of GHG emissions are uh, emitted by extracting metals. Um, and fossil fuels still comprise the largest share of exports in the world. And most of this is to support economic growth activities in cities. And so I was very struck by the Yale uh, Forestry School of, um, of the Mineral Criticality Project, and I'll show you a couple of slides from that. But take a look at this. You know, we talk about the renewable energy transition of the future. What does the renewable energy transition of the future mean? It means using a lot more rare earth minerals. It means a lot more resource extraction. And so this idea that we can move to sustainable cities through high technology, energy technologies, and sophisticated renewables entails a whole set of other trade-offs. Um, I liked this graph that shows um, how to achieve well-being without transcending planetary limits, which it remains the challenge. I think this has been seen, you know, this kind of representation has been seen quite a lot of times, but it still remains just as vital as ever. We cannot grow our ways into uh, human well-being, even though that seems to be um, quite the direction we're still going in. So here's the, um, the um, project that's, that's taking place at the Yale School of Forestry, and you can see what I think is particularly disturbing is the largest demand increases relate to a scenario in which increasingly equitable values and institutions prevail throughout the world. So there's still this relationship between economic well-being and progress and more material consumption, which is understandable, of course. Comfort, ease, access to technology is an enormously appealing and important strategy for development, but the consequences are still, I think, uh, need to be dealt with in a very serious manner. So that um, the increases of, of, in the use of metals imply substantially new energy expend expenditures. <coughs> So resource scarcities, if you recall, some of you may recall, that in the 70s there was a Club of Rome report about the limits to growth. And that uh, had a brief flurry of interest along with ideas of appropriate technology and living more simply on frugality, that term, uh, on the earth. This was in the 1970s and they were quick, quickly swept by um, with eco-modernist theories that will be able to increase our efficiencies to the point of overcoming the Jeevan's paradox, which um, we really have not been able to do as yet. Now maybe uh, physics will uh, overcome the Jeevan's paradox, but what you're dealing with is human behavior. 
And if you reduce your energy use because you have a more fuel efficient automobile, what happens? You're more t you have more tendency to drive farther. I mean, that's a trite example, but it is pervasive in terms of energy rebound. You get a new air conditioning system. You, use, you crank it down cooler so that you're more comfortable and you end up using more energy. We've done a lot of that analysis in my research lab. Um, the limits to growth was replaced by neoclassical economic and Cartesian science views of nature as other, that its functions were reproducible or substitutable, and that the market would price things to reflect scarcity and encourage a shift. So, for example, ecosystem services. You ruin a wetland because you need to develop it, well, you just create a fake, a new one, right? We know how to create wetlands that function just as well as the original wetland. And it's that kind of marketizing of nature and the idea that we can actually understand how those systems develop and how they work that has become much more pervasive. Because we are still under this umbrella of Cartesian science, which objectivizes nature as other and undermines our understanding of human <coughs> dependence on nature and how we are really in a dialectic relationship and a critical interdependence. Urban sustainability, that very uh, controversial term in certain sectors in the US, which was associated with the uh, United Nations black helicopters. Uh, <laughs> kind of unbelievable. Um, yet, what it has done is really avoid the issues of how cities can function well in a hydrocarbon age, right? Urban sustainability is about maintaining current economic growth better, essentially. It was a post-war, post-Cold War, World War um, <coughs> consensus that really opened up the door for increased marketization of just about everything. And there are ideas about pointing to goals of carbon neutrality, developing renewable energy resources for a transition to electrification with clean power, really neglect the fact that energy densities of alternatives are simply not the same as hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons are an amazing fuel. You can move them around. You can put them in your chainsaw and walk up the hill. You can do all kinds of things with these hydrocarbons. You can make plastics. You can make pharmaceuticals. You can make fertilizers. It's really incredible. And it's not easily substitutable with other resources. And that, I think, is really important to keep in mind in terms of how future cities are going to be able to uh, develop. Imagine your uh, gigantic earth-moving machine with an electric battery. Still not on the market, I've looked. So I think that with a better understanding of flows in the contexts of regulation, formal and informal, it becomes clear that cities as we know them will no longer be the same post-hydrocarbons, nor will they be as large in the future. And that has all kinds of very scary and difficult implications, particularly for large cities that have attracted immigrants and migrants um, hoping for a better life. And yet, um, this transition, I think, is inevitable. The, and that the material flows will uh, needed for our energy modernity will not be as readily available and that we will need to track them. We'll need to know where the copper is in the city, in the landfill. And we also need to know that the quality of those metals and those resources will not be the same, right, because of the second law of thermodynamics. We need to be very clear headed about those kinds of uh, structural obstacles to really thinking about how we're going to refashion our cities. This reinhabitation, which will be necessary because we will need to know place, will require the reconstruction and creation of understandings of specific environments, resources, patterns of nature that will enable humans to live in a constructive relationship with those places, and that is the future of cities. So what about these transitions? Well, I, was, I had the great privilege of being at RIN uh, last fall, and I had an opportunity to really um, be exposed to some of the still extremely vibrant and living traditions uh, available here in terms of understanding of local resources, so the clay, the wood, um, and all kinds of things. And, and without being too romantic about it, I, I understand, um, 
that, that local knowledge, which occurs in many places across the world still, is what we need to be able to preserve, nurture, and, under, and, and build upon. And I think um, some of the work of, that Niles af referred to the, uh, yesterday um, serve as this kind of template. But the question is, who is going to be able to do that? Who will want to be able to really, um, in a transition period, maintain those kinds of activities and those kinds of ways of knowing is, a, is an enormous challenge. One of the enormously uh, fascinating visits I had in Kyoto was to a traditional fabric uh, manufacturing uh, plant. There's still some in um, downtown Kyoto. You can hear the looms chuk, 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 in the background. Some of them are still hand looms. And yet, at the same time, coupled with a very highly sophisticated IT, um, um, I don't know how to describe it, but the patterns that are used to make the fabric come through electronically onto the loom. And it is this really sophisticated hybrid of high technology, IT, and handcraft that I think um, may offer some really interesting ideas about the future, particularly since some of that IT could be run, um, despite what I said earlier, uh, <laughs> on renewables, right? So how do we match and pair the use of renewables and the kind of densities of energy available in the renewables with a coupling of old practices and sophisticated understanding of when you intervene with appropriate kinds of technologies that are information-based. Um, I think it will involve patient, a people-patient production with these hybrid uh, systems of human dexterity in IT. We also forget about human dexterity. We talk about um, low-skill jobs, right, especially, especially in the West. Oh, those are low-skill jobs, the person that rakes, the person that sweeps, the person that does all of these kinds of menial tasks. Well, if you've actually done that task yourself, weeding, hoeing, pruning, um, sewing, all of those kinds of things, you know that actually the dexterity, the hand-to-eye coordination, the eye to see what you're doing, is not something that is low skill. It's something that requires humans to be actively engaged in the process through their body. And I think that's still an important um, attribute that we can bring to tasks. And so that dexterity is a really uh, important um, characteristic that humans have in their relationship with the production process. So as I said, there'll be uh, energy from renewables, but, and probably hydrocarbons, but much less. They'll be really expensive, and most energy will have a lot less energy density. So this involves, in my opinion, um, a vision about re-inhabitation and degrowth. And thank you to Christoph, who introduced me to Dare You, um, his notion of this sensory, affective, and aesthetic basis for a process of degrowth and re-inhabitation of the countryside and reinvention of the cities, I think offers us a pathway to reintegrate the urban and the rural. And it's important politically as well, because we know that much of the age of anger and the, at least in the West, the anger that arises is because of the sense of being useless in the countryside, of being disinvested in, of having no purpose, of having no relationship that is constructive with the city, let alone, um, you know, if you're using uh, uh, digital farming, you're completely the wage laborer of Monsanto or whatever uh, big corporation. And so we have to transcend those kinds of dichotomies and shift to care, craft, and creativity and the cultivation of ordinary virtues, of generosity, of kindness, of forbearance, because for human society to work, it has to be based on mutualism. And of course, we've been inculcated individ into individualism, into a kind of Darwinian competitivity that we're all going to be entrepreneurs now, I'll be the Uber driver, Lyft driver, 
delivery, blah, 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 do my own taxes, take care of my own health care, you know, <laughs> and on and on, that divides us when in fact the only way society really works is through collaboration and cooperation. So um, that also then has to extend to the planet we live on. Because without that planet, of course, we can't really do things. And so to understand those patterns and work with them, how do you um, increase soil fertility through your night soil? How do you know how much to apply? The urine project here is fantastic, right? How do we capture all this waste that we produce many times a day that is an enormous source of uh, fertility for the soil? And so on. We're just we just really need to understand that we have an active role in that relationship that can be a constructive role. I'm uh, running out of time, but I have maybe two slides. So I see uh, smaller distributed cities that um, retain this kind of ancient, really, role of the city as keynotes of cultural and social complexity, of scientific and technological innovation, of a certain kind of economic growth that's predicated on artisanship and craft and care, of civil society, creativity, tolerance, and knowledge that can be connected through the digital technologies of communication, transcending space and time to share knowledge. Because of course, part of the danger is that cities become rural isolates, I mean, uh, become city-states and isolated from their rural um, context and isolated from one another. So how do we not fall back into a kind of old uh, pattern of provincialism and competitivity among cities? And perhaps it's through this, this, these new digital technologies. Maybe those are really a platform for uh, bringing us together in that kind of way. Um, and I think that cities, the role of cities, can really be to lead a global philosophical, ethical, and political shift to a different relationship between humans and nature, where we acknowledge that society is never and has never been a self-sufficient totality free of nature. And I guess that's why I have a little bit of a problem with Anthropocene, because we, we've been really involved in changing uh, nature for a long time. And that they can be centers of the cultivation of virtue, of phronesis, which is a, you know, a, Greek, a Greek term of about practical, ordinary virtues of insight, compassion, and wisdom. Um, that may seem idealistic, utopian, dreamy, and um, pretty unrealistic, but I do think we have a project ahead of us thinking about what cities are for going forward. Are they really this winner-takes-all um, place of economic growth, these engines of economic growth? Can we afford that in the era of this huge transformation that's taking place of the, on the planet? I don't think so. And so I think we have to force ourselves to contemplate, to think about, to engage in a new thinking, a new vision, uh, or perhaps a hybrid old new vision of what cities can be and cities will be in the future. And that they are the doorways to uh, future Earth. Of course, it entails lots of very difficult questions about what happens to places like um, uh, Lagos, what happens to places like Lima, what happens to places like Mexico City, or many other of these mega cities that are characterized by so many people who've come for some hope of surviving um, the rural dislocations that are taking place all over the place. So this is not an apolitical project by any means. This is not a dreamy project by any means. It's a deeply political project motivated by the desire to live um, as humans well on the planet with the planet. And of course, there will be winners and losers as there have been um, historically. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.